Hello friends, I welcome you to the second installment of this calm reading of the Great Gatsby. Tonight I will read for you chapters 4, 5 as well as 6. If you enjoy this reading, it would be wonderful if you could click the like button and consider subscribing, so you will not miss any of the upcoming relaxing readings. Before we begin, find yourself that special place where you can relax. Ease yourself into that place and get comfortable. And let us continue with the great Gatsby. Chapter 4 on Sunday morning, while church bells rang in the villages along shore, the world and its mistress returned to Gatsby's house and twinkled hilariously on his lawn. He's a bootlegger, said the young ladies, moving somewhere between his cocktails and his flowers. One time he killed a man who had found out that he was nephew to von Hindenburg, and second cousin to the devil. Reach me a rose, honey, and pour me a last drop into that there crystal glass. Once I wrote down on the empty spaces of a timetable the names of those who came to Gatsby's house that summer. It is an old timetable now, disingrated at its faults, and had it this schedule in effect July 5th, 1922, but I can still read the grey names, and they will give you a better impression that my generalities of those who accepted Gatsby's hospitality and paid him the subtle tribute of knowing nothing whatever about him. From East Egg then came the Chester Beckers and the Leeches, and a man named Bunsen, whom I knew at Yale and Dr. Webster Kivett, who was drowned last summer up in Maine, and the Hornbeams and the Willie Voltaires, and a whole clan named Blackbuck, who always gathered in a corner and flipped up their noses like goats at whosoever came near, and the Ismays and the Christies, or rather Hubert Auerbach and a Mr. Christie's wife, and Edgar Beaver, whose hair, they say, turned cotton white one winter afternoon, for no good reason at all. Clarence Endive was from East Egg, as I remember. He came only once in white knickerbockers, and had a fight with a bum named Etty in the garden. From farther out on the island came the Cheadles, and the O. R. P. Schraders and the Stonewall Jackson Abrams of Georgia, and the Fisher Guards and the Ripley Snells. Snell was there three days before he went to the penitentiary, so drunk out on the gravel drive that Mrs. Ulysses Sweet's automobile ran over his right hand. The Dancies came, too, and S. B. Whitebait, who was well over sixty, and Maurice A. Fleck, and the Hammerheads, and Beluga, the tobacco importer, and Beluga's girls. From West Egg came the Poles, and the Mulredys, and Cecil Roebuck, and Cecil Schoen, and Gullick, the state senator, and Newton Orchard, who controlled films par excellence, and Eckhaust and Clyde Cohen, and Don S. Schwartz, the son, and Arthur McCarty, all connected with the movies in one way or another, and the Catlips, and the Bembergs, and G. Earl Muldoon, brother to that Muldoon who afterwards strangled his wife. Da Fontano, the promoter, came there, and Ed Lagos, and James B. Rodgott Ferret, and to the Jongs, and Ernest Lilly. They came to gamble, and when Ferret wandered into the garden, it meant he was cleaned out, and associated traction would have to fluctuate profitably 
next day. A man named Klipsprenger was there so often that he became known as the Border. I doubt if he had any other home. Of theatrical people, there were Gus Weiss and Horace O'Donovan and Lester Meyer and George Duckweed and Francis Bowe. Also from New York were the Cromes and the Backhysons and the Denicus and Russell Betty and the Corrigans and the Kellerheads and the Devors and the Scullies and S. W. Belcher and the Smirks and the Young Quins, divorced now, and Henry L. Palmetto, who killed himself by jumping in front of a subway train in Times Square. Benny McClanahan arrived always with four girls. They were never quite the same ones in physical person, but they were so identical one with another that it inevitably seemed they had been there before. I have forgotten their names, Jacqueline, I think, or else Consuela, or Gloria, or Judy, or Joan. And the last names were either the melodious names of flowers and months, or the sterner ones of the great American capitalists, whose cousins, if pressed, they would confess themselves to be. In addition to all these, I can remember that Faustina O'Brien came there at least once, and the Baedecker girls and young Brewer, who had his nose shut off in the war, and Mr. Albrooksberger and Miss Hark, his fiancée, and Ardita Fitzpeters, and Mr. P. Jewett, once head of the American Legion, and Miss Claudia Hip, with a man reputed to be her chauffeur, and a prince of something, whom we called Duke, and whose name, if I ever knew it, I have forgotten. All these people came to Gatsby's house in the summer. At nine o'clock, one morning late in July, Gatsby's gorgeous car lurched up the rocky drive to my door and gave out a burst of melody from its three-noted horn. It was the first time he had called on me, though I had gone to two of his parties, mounted in his hydroplane and, at his urgent invitation, made frequent use of his speech. Good morning, old sport. You're having lunch with me today, and I thought we'd ride up together. He was balancing himself on the dashboard of his car, with that resourcefulness of movement that is so peculiarly American. That comes, I suppose, with the absence of lifting work in youth, and even more, with the formless grace of our nervous, sporadic games. This quality was continually breaking through his punctilious manner in the shape of restlessness. He was never quite still. There was always a tapping foot somewhere or the impatient opening and closing of a hand. He saw me looking with admiration at his car. It's pretty, isn't it, old sport? He jumped off to give me a better view. Haven't you ever seen it before? I'd seen it. Everybody had seen it. It was a rich cream color, bright with nickel, swollen here and there in its monstrous length, with triumphant hat boxes, and supper boxes, and tool boxes, and terraced with a labyrinth of windshields that mirrored a dozen suns. Sitting down behind many layers of glass, in a sort of green leather conservatory, we started to town. I had talked with him perhaps half a dozen times in the past month and found, to my disappointment, that he had little to say. So my first impression, that he was a person of some undefined consequence, had gradually faded and he had become simply the proprietor of an elaborate roadhouse next door. And then, came that disconcerting ride. We hadn't reached West Egg Village before Gatsby began leaving his elegant sentences unfinished, and slapping himself indecisively on the knee of his caramel-colored suit. Look here, old sport, 
he broke out surprisingly. What's your opinion of me, anyhow? A little overwhelmed, I began the generalized evasion which that question deserves. Well, I'm going to tell you something about my life, he interrupted. I don't want you to get a wrong idea of me from all these stories you hear. So he was aware of the bizarre accusations that flavored conversation in his halls. I'll tell you God's truth. His right hand suddenly ordered divine retribution to stand by. I am the son of some wealthy people in the Middle West, all dead now. I was brought up in America, but educated at Oxford, because all my ancestors have been educated there for many years. It is a family tradition. He looked at me sideways, and I knew why Jordan Baker had believed he was lying. He heard the phrase, educated at Oxford, or swallowed it, or choked on it, as though it had bothered him before. And with this doubt, his whole statement fell to pieces. And I wondered if there wasn't something a little sinister about him, after all. What part of the Middle West? I inquired casually. San Francisco. I see. My family all died and I came into a good deal of money. His voice was solemn, as if the memory of that sudden extinction of a clan still haunted him. For a moment I suspected that he was pulling my leg, but a glance at him convinced me otherwise. After that I lived like a young Raja in all the capitals of Europe. Paris, Venice, Rome collecting jewels, chiefly rubies, hunting big game, painting a little, things for myself only, and trying to forget something very sad that had happened to me long ago. With an effort I managed to restrain my incredulous laughter. The very phrases were worn so threadbare that they evoked no image except that of a turbaned character, a leaking sawdust that every pore as he pursued the tiger through the Bois de Boulogne. Then came the war, old sport. It was a great relief, and I tried very hard to die, but I seemed to bear an enchanted life. I accepted a commission as first lieutenant when it began. In the Argonne Forest I took the remains of my machine-gun battalion so far forward that there was a half a mile gap on either side of us where the infantry couldn't advance. We stayed there two days and two nights, a hundred and thirty men with sixty Lewis guns. And when the infantry came up at last, they found the insignia of three German divisions among the piles of dead. I was promoted to be major, and every Allied government gave me a decoration, even Montenegro, little Montenegro, down on the Adriatic Sea. Little Montenegro, he lifted up the words and nodded at them with a smile. The smile comprehended Montenegro's troubled history and sympathized with the brave struggles of the Montenegrin people. It appreciated fully the chain of national circumstances which had elicited this tribute from Montenegro's warm little heart. My incredulity was submerged in fascination now. It was like skimming hastily through a dozen magazines. He reached in his pocket, and a piece of metal slung on a ribbon fell into my palm. That's the one from Montenegro. To my astonishment, the thing had an authentic look. Oderi din Danilo ran the circular legend. Montenegro Nicholas Rex. Turn it! Major J. Gatsby, I read, for valor extraordinary. Here's another thing I always carry, a souvenir of Oxford days. It was taken in Trinity Court. The man on my left is now the Earl of Doncaster. It was a photograph of half a dozen young men in blazers, 
loafing in an archway through which were visible a host of spires. There was Gatsby, looking a little, not much, younger, with a cricket bat in his hand. Then it was all true. I saw the skins of tigers flaming in his palace on the Grand Canal. I saw him opening a chest of rubies to ease with their crimson-lighted depths, the gnawings of his broken heart. I'm going to make a big request of you today, he said, pocketing his souvenirs with satisfaction. So I thought you ought to know something about me. I didn't want you to think I was just some nobody. You see, I usually find myself among strangers, because I drift here and there, trying to forget the sad things that happened to me. He hesitated. You'll hear about it this afternoon. At lunch? No, this afternoon. I happened to find out that you're taking Miss Baker to tea. Do you mean you're in love with Miss Baker? No, old sport, I'm not. But Miss Baker has kindly consented to speak to you about this matter. I hadn't the faintest idea what this matter was, but I was more annoyed than interested. I hadn't asked Jordan to tea in order to discuss Mr. J. Gatsby. I was sure the request would be something utterly fantastic, and for the moment I was sorry I'd ever set foot upon his overpopulated lawn. He wouldn't say another word. His correctness grew on him as we neared the city. We passed Port Roosevelt, where there was a glimpse of red-belted ocean-going ships, and sped along a cobbled slum lined with the dark, undeserted saloons of the faded guild 1900s. Then the Valley of Ashes opened out on both sides of us, and I had a glimpse of Mrs. Wilson straining at the garage pump with panting vanity as we went by. With fenders spread like wings, we scattered light through half Astoria. Only half, for, as we twisted among the pillars of the elevated, I heard the familiar jug jug spat of a motorcycle and a frantic policeman rode alongside. All right, Osport, called Gatsby. We slowed down. Taking a white card from his wallet, he waved it before the man's eyes. Right you are, agreed the policeman, tipping his cap. Know you next time, Mr. Gatsby. Excuse me. What was that? I inquired. The picture of Oxford? I was able to do the commissioner a favor once, and he sends me a Christmas card every year. Over the great bridge, with the sunlight through the girders making a constant flicker upon the moving cars, with the city rising up across the river in white heaps, and sugar lumps, all built with a wish out of non-olfactory money. The city scene from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city scene for the first time, in its first wild promise of all the mystery and beauty in the world. A dead man passed us in a hearse, heaped with blooms, followed by two carriages with drawn blinds, and by more cheerful carriages for friends. The friends looked out at us with the tragic eyes and short upper lips of southeastern Europe, and I was glad that the sight of Gatsby's splendid car was included in the somber holiday. As we crossed Blackwell's Island, a limousine passed us, driven by a white chauffeur, in which sat three moodish negroes, two bucks and a girl. I laughed aloud as the yokes of their eyeballs rolled toward us in haughty rivalry. Anything can happen now that we've slid over this bridge, I thought. Anything at all. Even Gatsby could happen without any particular wonder. Roaring noon. In a well-fanned 42nd Street cellar, 
I met Gatsby for lunch. Blinking away the brightness of the street outside, my eyes picked him out obscurely in the anteroom, talking to another man. Mr. Carraway, this is my friend, Mr. Wolfsheim. A small, flat-nosed Jew raised his large head and regarded me with two fine growths of hair which luxuriated in either nostril. After a moment I discovered his tiny eyes in the half-darkness. So I took one look at him, said Mr. Wolfsheim, shaking my hand earnestly. And what do you think I did? What? I inquired politely, but evidently he was not addressing me, for he dropped my hand and covered Gatsby with his expressive nose. I handed the money to Katzbaugh, and I said, All right, Katzbaugh, don't pay him a penny till he shuts his mouth. He shut it then and there. Gatsby took an arm of each of us and moved forward into the restaurant, whereupon Mr. Wolfsheim swallowed a new sentence he was starting, and lapsed into a somnambulatory abstraction. Eyeballs? asked the head waiter. This is a nice restaurant here, said Mr. Wolfsheim, looking at the Presbyterian nymphs on the ceiling. But I like across the street better. Yes, highballs, agreed Gatsby. And then to Mr. Wolfsheim. It's too hot over there. Hot and small, yes, said Mr. Wolfsheim, but full of memories. What place is that? I asked. The old metropole. The old metropole, brooded Mr. Wolfsheim gloomily. Filled with faces, dead and gone, filled with friends, gone now forever. I can't forget, so long as I lived the night they shot Rosie Rosenthal there. It was six of us at the table, and Rosie had eaten and drunk a lot all evening. When it was almost morning, the waiter came up to him with a funny look and says somebody wants to speak to him outside. All right, says Rosie, and begins to get up, and I pulled him down in his chair. Let the bastards come in here if they want you, Rosie, but don't you, so help me, move outside this room. It was four o'clock in the morning then, and if we'd have raised the blinds, we'd have seen daylight. Did he go? I asked innocently. Sure he went. Mr. Wolfsheim's nose flashed at me indignantly. He turned around in the door and says, Don't let the waiter take away my coffee. Then he went out on the sidewalk, and they shot him there three times in his full belly, and drove away. Four of them were electrocuted, I said, remembering. Five with Becker. His nostrils turned to me in an interested way. I understand you're looking for a business connection. The juxtaposition of these two remarks was startling. Gatsby answered for me. Oh, no, he exclaimed. This isn't the man. No, Mr. Wolfsheim seemed disappointed. This is just a friend. I told you we'd talk about that some other time. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Wolfsheim. I had a wrong man. A succulent hash arrived, and Mr. Wolfsheim, forgetting the more sentimental atmosphere of the old metropole, began to eat with ferocious delicacy. His eyes, meanwhile, roved very slowly around the room. He completed the arc by turning to inspect the people directly behind. I think that, except for my presence, he would have taken one short glance beneath our own table. Look here, old sport, said Gatsby, leaning toward me. I'm afraid I made you a little angry this morning in the car. There was the smile again, but this time I held out against it. I don't like mysteries, I answered, and I don't understand why you wouldn't come out frankly and tell me what you want. Why has it all got to come through Miss Baker? Oh, it's nothing underhand, he assured me. 
Miss Baker's a great sportswoman, you know, and she'd never do anything that wasn't all right. Suddenly he looked at his watch, jumped up, and hurried from the room, leaving me with Mr. Wolfseam at the table. He has to telephone, said Mr. Wolfseam, following him with his eyes. Fine fellow, isn't he? Handsome to look at, and a perfect gentleman. Yes, he's an Oxford man. Oh, he went to Oxford College in England. You know Oxford College? I've heard of it. It's one of the most famous colleges in the world. Have you known Gatsby for a long time? I inquired. Several years, he answered in a gratified way. I made the pleasure of his acquaintance just after the war. But I knew I had discovered a man of fine breeding. After I talked with him an hour, I said to myself, there's the kind of man you'd like to take home and introduce to your mother and sister. He paused. I see you're looking at my cuff buttons. I hadn't been looking at them, but I did now. They were composed of oddly familiar pieces of ivory. Finest specimens of human molars, he informed me. Well, I inspected them. That's a very interesting idea. Yeah, he flipped his sleeves up under his coat. Yeah, God's be very careful about women. He would never so much as look at a friend's wife. When the subject of this indistinctive trust returned to the table and sat down, Mr. Wolfsheim drank his coffee with a jerk and got to his feet. I have enjoyed my lunch, he said, and I'm going to run off from you two young men before I outstay my welcome. Don't hurry, Maya, said Gatsby without enthusiasm. Mr. Wolfsheim raised his hand in a sort of benediction. You are very polite, but I belong to another generation, he announced solemnly. You sit here and discuss your sports and your young ladies and your... He supplied an imaginary noun with another wave of his hand. As for me, I am fifty years old, and I won't impose myself on you any longer. As he shook hands and turned away, his tragic nose was trembling. I wondered if I had said anything to offend him. He becomes very sentimental sometimes, explained Gatsby. This is one of his sentimental days. He's quite a character around New York, a denizen of Broadway. Who is he, anyhow, an actor? No, a dentist. Maya Wolfsheim? No, he's a gambler. Gatsby hesitated, then added coolly, He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Fix the World Series? I repeated. The idea staggered me. I remembered, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1919. But if I had thought of it at all, I would have thought of it as a thing that merely happened, the end of some inevitable chain. It never occurred to me that one man could start to play with the faith of fifty million people, with the single-mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe. He just saw the opportunity. Why isn't he in jail? They can't get to him, old sport. He's a smart man. I insisted on paying the check. As the waiter brought my change, I caught sight of Tom Buchanan across the crowded room. Come along with me for a minute, I said. I've got to say hello to someone. When he saw us, Tom jumped up and took half a dozen steps in our direction. Where have you been? he demanded eagerly. Daisy's is furious because you haven't called up. This is Mr. Gatsby, Mr. Buchanan. He shook hands briefly, and a strained, unfamiliar look of embarrassment came over Gatsby's face. How have you been anyhow? demanded Tom of me. How do you happen to come up this far to eat? I've been having lunch with Mr. Gatsby. I turned toward Mr. Gatsby, but he was no longer there.
One October day in 1917, said Jordan Baker that afternoon, sitting very straight on a straight chair in the tea garden at the Plaza Hotel. I was walking along from one place to another, half on the sidewalks and half on the lawns. I was happy on the lawns, because I had on shoes from England, with rubber knobs on the soles, that bite into the soft ground. I had on a new plate skirt also, that blew a little in the wind, and whenever this happened, the red, white and blue banners in front of all the houses stretched out stiff, and said, tut 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 tut, in a disapproving way. The largest of the banners and the largest of the lawns belonged to Daisy Fay's house. She was just eighteen, two years older than me, and by far the most popular of all the young girls in Louisville. She dressed in white and had a little white roadster, and all day long the telephone rang in her house, and excited young officers from Camp Taylor demanded the privilege of monopolizing her that night. Anyways, for an hour. When I came opposite her house that morning, her white roadster was beside the curb, and she was sitting in it with a lieutenant I had never seen before. They were so engrossed in each other that she didn't see me until I was five feet away. Hello, Jordan, she called unexpectedly. Please come here. I was flattered that she wanted to speak to me, because of all the older girls I admired her most. She asked me if I was going to the Red Cross to make bandages. I was. Well then, would I tell them that she couldn't come that day? The officer looked at Daisy while she was speaking, in a way that every young girl wants to be looked at some time. And because it seemed romantic to me, I have remembered the incident ever since. His name was Jay Gatsby, and I didn't lay eyes on him again for forty years. Even after I'd met him on Long Island, I didn't realize it was the same man. That was 1917. By the next year I had a few bows myself, and I began to play in the tournaments, so I didn't see Daisy very often. She went with a slightly older crowd, when she went with anyone at all. Wild rumors were circulating about her, how her mother had found her packing her bag one winter night to go to New York and say goodbye to a soldier who was going overseas. She was effectually prevented, but she wasn't on speaking terms with her family for several weeks. After that she didn't play around with the soldiers any more but only with a few flat-footed, short-sighted young men in town who couldn't get into the army at all. By the next autumn she was gay again, gay as ever. She had a debut after the armistice, and in February she was presumably engaged to a man from New Orleans. In June she married Tom Buchanan of Chicago, with more pomp and circumstance than Louisville ever knew before. He came down with a hundred people in four private cars, and hired a whole floor of the Mulebach Hotel, and the day before the wedding he gave her a string of pearls, valued at three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I was a bridesmaid. I came into her room half an hour before the bridal dinner, and found her lying on her bed, as lovely as the June night, in her flower dress. and as drunk as a monkey. She had a bottle of sauterne in one hand and a letter in the other. Congratulate me, she muttered. Never had a drink before, but oh, how I do enjoy it. What's the matter, Daisy? I was scared, I can tell you. I'd never seen a girl like that before. Here, dearies, she groped around in a wastebasket she had with her on the bed and pulled out a string of pearls. Take him downstairs and give him back to whoever they belong to. Tell him all daisies change her mind. Say, daisies change her mind. She began to cry, 
She cried and cried. I rushed out and found her mother's maid, and we locked the door and got her into a cold bath. She wouldn't let go of her letter. She took it into the tub with her and squeezed it up in a wet ball, and only let me leave it in the soap dish when she saw that it was coming to pieces like snow. But she didn't say another word. We gave her spirits of ammonia and put ice on her forehead and hooked her back into her dress. And half an hour later, when we walked out of the room, the pearls were around her neck and the incident was over. Next day, at five o'clock, she married Tom Buchanan without so much as a shiver and started off on a three-month trip to the South Seas. I saw them in Santa Barbara when they came back, and I thought I'd never seen a girl so mad about her husband. If he left the room for a minute, she'd look around uneasy and say, Where's Tom gone? And where? The most abstracted expression until she saw him coming in the door. She used to sit on the sand with his head in her lap by the hour, rubbing her fingers over his eyes and looking at him with unfathomable delight. It was touching to see them together. It made you laugh in a hushed, fascinated way. That was in August. A week after I left Santa Barbara, Tom ran into a wagon on the Ventura Road one night and ripped the front wheel of his car. The girl who was with him got into the papers too because her arm was broken. She was one of the chambermaids in the Santa Barbara Hotel. The next April, Daisy had her little girl, and they went to France for a year. I saw them one spring in Cannes, and later in Deauville, and then they came back to Chicago to settle down. Daisy was popular in Chicago, as you know. They moved with a fast crowd, all of them young and rich, and wild, but she came out with an absolutely perfect reputation, perhaps because she doesn't drink. It's a great advantage not to drink among hard-drinking people. You can hold your tongue, and moreover, you can time any little irregularity of your own, so that everybody else is so blind that they don't see or care. Perhaps Daisy never went in for a moor at all, and yet there's something in that voice of hers. Well, about six weeks ago, she heard the name Gatsby for the first time in years. It was when I asked you, do you remember? If you knew Gatsby in West Egg. After you had gone home, she came into my room and woke me up and said, What Gatsby? And when I described him, I was half asleep. She said in the strangest voice that it must be the man she used to know. It wasn't until then that I connected this Gatsby with the officer in her white car. When Jordan Baker had finished telling all this, we had left the plaza for half an hour and were driving in a Victoria through Central Park. The sun had gone down behind the tall apartments of the movie stars in the West Fifties, and the clear voices of children, already gathered like crickets on the grass, rose through the hot twilight. I'm the Sheikh of Araby, your love belongs to me. At night, when you're asleep, into your tent, I'll creep. It was a strange coincidence, I said. But it wasn't a coincidence at all. Why not? Gatsby bought that house so that Daisy would be just across the bay. Then it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. He came alive to me delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. He wants to know, continued Jordan, if you'll invite Daisy to your house some afternoon and then let him come over. The modesty of the demand shook me. He had waited five years and bought a mansion where he dispensed starlight to casual moths so that he could come over some afternoon to a stranger's garden. Did I have to know all this before he could ask such a little thing? He's afraid. 
he's waited so long. He thought you might be offended. You see, he's regular tough under it all. Something worried me. Why didn't he ask you to arrange a meeting? He wants her to see his house, she explained, and your house is right next door. Oh. I think he half expected her to wander into one of his parties some night, went on Jordan, but she never did. Then he began asking people casually if they knew her, and I was the first one he found. It was that night he sent for me at his dance, and you should have heard the elaborate way he worked up to it. Of course, I immediately suggested a luncheon in New York, and I thought he'd go mad. I don't want to do anything out of the way, he kept saying. I want to see her right next door. When I said you were a particular friend of Tom's, he started to abandon the whole idea. He doesn't know very much about Tom, though he says he's read a Chicago paper for years, just on the chance of catching a glimpse of Daisy's name. It was dark now, and as we dipped under a little bridge, I put my arm around Jordan's golden shoulder and drew her toward me and asked her to dinner. Suddenly I wasn't thinking of Daisy and Gatsby any more, but of this clean, hard, limited person who dealt in universal skepticism and who leaned back jauntily just within the circle of my arm. A phrase began to beat in my ears with a sort of heady excitement. There are only the pursuit, the pursuing, the busy, and the tired. And Daisy ought to have something in her life, murmured Jordan to me. Does she want to see Gatsby? She's not to know about it. Gatsby doesn't want her to know. You're just supposed to invite her to tea. We passed the barrier of dark trees, and then the facade of 59th Street. A block of delicate pale light beamed down into the park. Unlike Gatsby and Tom Buchanan, I had no girl whose disembodied face floated along the dark cornices and blinding signs. And so I drew up the girl beside me, tightening my arms. Her wan, scornful mouth smiled. And so I drew her up again closer, this time to my face. Chapter 5 When I came home to West Egg that night, I was afraid for a moment that my house was on fire. Two o'clock and the whole corner of the peninsula was blazing with light, which fell unreal on the shrubbery and made thin, elongating glints upon the roadside wires. Turning a corner, I saw that it was Gatsby's house, lit from tower to cellar. At first, I thought it was another party, a wild rout, that had resolved itself into hide-and-go-seek, or sardines in the box, with all the house thrown open to the game. But there wasn't a sound only wind in the trees, which blew the wires and made the lights go off and on again as if the house had winked into the darkness. As my taxi groaned away, I saw Gatsby walking toward me across his lawn. Your place looks like the world's fair, I said. Does it? He turned his eyes toward it absently. I have been glancing into some of the rooms. Let's go to Coney Island, old sport, in my car. It's too late. Well, suppose we take a plunge in the swimming pool. I haven't made use of it all summer. I've got to go to bed. All right, he waited, looking at me with suppressed eagerness. I talked with Miss Baker, I said after a moment. I'm going to call up Daisy tomorrow and invite her over here to tea. Oh, that's all right, he said carelessly. I don't want to put you to any trouble. What day would suit you? What day would suit you? He corrected me quickly. I don't want to put you to any trouble, you see? 
How about the day after tomorrow? He considered for a moment, then with reluctance. I want to get the grass cut, he said. We both looked down at the grass. There was a sharp line where my ragged lawn ended, and the darker, well-capped expanse of his began. I suspected that he meant my grass. There's another little thing, he said, uncertainly, and hesitated. Would you rather put it off for a few days? I asked. Oh, it isn't about that. At least, he fumbled with a series of beginnings. Why, I thought, why, look here, old sport, you don't make much money, do you? Not very much. This seemed to reassure him, and he continued more confidently. I thought you didn't, if you'll pardon my... You see, I carry on a little business on the side, a sort of sideline, you understand? And I thought that if you don't make very much, you're selling bonds, aren't you, old sport? Trying to? Well, this would interest you. It wouldn't take up much of your time, and you might pick up a nice bit of money. It happens to be a rather confidential sort of thing. I realize now that under different circumstances, that conversation might have been one of the crises of my life. But because the offer was obviously and tactlessly for a service to be rendered, I had no choice except to cut him off there. I've got my hands full, I said. I'm much obliged, but I couldn't take on any more work. You wouldn't have to do any business with Wolsim. Evidently, he thought that I was shying away from the connection mentioned at lunch, but I assured him he was wrong. He waited a moment longer, hoping I'd begin a conversation, but I was too absorbed to be responsive. So he went unwillingly home. The evening had made me light-headed and happy. I think I walked into a deep sleep as I entered my front door. So I don't know whether or not Gatsby went to Coney Island, or for how many hours he glanced into rooms, while his house blazed godly on. I called up Daisy from the office next morning and invited her to come to tea. Don't bring Tom, I warned her. What? Don't bring Tom. Who is Tom? she asked innocently. The day agreed upon was pouring rain. At eleven o'clock a man in a raincoat, dragging a lawnmower, tapped at my front door, and said that Mr. Gatsby had sent him over to cut my grass. This reminded me that I had forgotten to tell my Finn to come back. So I drove into West Egg Village to search for her among soggy whitewashed alleys, and to buy some cups and lemons and flowers. The flowers were unnecessary, for at two o'clock a greenhouse arrived by Gatsby's, with innumerable receptacles to contain in. An hour later the front door opened nervously, and Gatsby, in a white flannel suit, silver shirt, and gold-colored tie hurried in. He was pale, and there were dark signs of sleeplessness beneath his eyes. Is everything all right? he asked immediately. The grass looks fine, if that's what you mean. What grass? he inquired blankly. Oh, the grass in the yard. He looked out the window at it, but, judging from his expression, I don't believe he saw a thing. Looks very good, he remarked vaguely. One of the papers said they thought the rain would stop about four. I think it was the journal. Have you got everything you need in the shape of, of tea? I took him into the pantry, where he looked a little reproachfully at the fen. Together we scrutinized the twelve lemon cakes from the delicatessen shop. Will they do? I asked. Of course, of course, they are fine. And he added hollowly, Old sport. The rain cooled about half-past three to a damp mist, 
through which occasionally thin drops swam like dew. Gatsby looked with vacant eyes through a copy of Clay's Economics, starting at the finished tread that shook the kitchen floor, and peering towards the bleared windows from time to time, as if a series of invisible but alarming happenings were taking place outside. Finally he got up and informed me, in an uncertain voice, that he was going home. Why's that? Nobody's coming to tea. It's too late. He looked at his watch, as if there was something pressing demanding on his time elsewhere. I can't wait all day. Don't be silly. It's just two minutes to four. He sat down miserably, as if I had pushed him, and simultaneously there was the sound of a motor turning into my lane. We both jumped up, and... A little harrowed myself, I went out into the yard. Under the dripping bare lilac trees, a large open car was coming up the drive. It stopped. Daisy's face, tipped sideways beneath a three-cornered lavender hat, looked out at me with a bright, ecstatic smile. Is this absolutely where you live, my dearest one? The exhilarating ripple of her voice was a wild tonic in the rain. I had to follow the sound of it for a moment, up and down, with my ear alone before any words came through. A damp streak of hair lay like a dash of blue paint across her cheek, and her hand was wet with glistening drops as I took it to help her from the car. Are you in love with me? she said low in my ear. Or why did I have to come alone? That's the secret of Castle Rackland. Tell your chauffeur to go far away and spend an hour. Come back in an hour, Freddy. Then, in a grave murmur, His name is Freddy. Doesn't the gasoline affect his nose? I don't think so, she said innocently. Why? We went in. To my overwhelming surprise, the living room was deserted. Well, that's funny, I exclaimed. What's funny? She turned her head as there was a light, dignified knocking at the door. I went out and opened it. Gatsby, pale as death, with his hands plunged like weights in his coat pockets, was standing in a puddle of water, glaring tragically into my eyes. With his hands still in his coat pockets, he stalked by me into the hall, turned sharply as if he were on a wire, and disappeared into the living room. It wasn't a bit funny. Aware of the loud beating of my own heart, I pulled the door to, against the increasing rain. For half a minute there wasn't a sound. Then, from the living room, I heard a sort of choking murmur and part of a laugh followed by Daisy's voice on a clear, artificial note. I certainly am awfully glad to see you again. A pause. It endured horribly. I had nothing to do in the hall, so I went into the room. Gatsby, his hands still in his pockets, was reclining against the mantelpiece in a strained counterfeit of perfect ease. Even of boredom, his head leaned back so far that it rested against the face of a defunct mantelpiece clock, and from this position his distraught eyes stared down at Daisy, who was sitting, frightened but graceful, on the edge of a stiff chair. We've met before, muttered Gatsby, his eyes glanced momentarily at me and his lips parted with an abortive attempt at a laugh. Luckily, the clock took this moment to tilt dangerously at the pressure of his head, whereupon he turned and caught it with trembling fingers, and set it back in place. Then he sat down, rigidly, his elbow on the arm of the sofa, and his chin in his hand. I'm sorry about the clock, he said. My own face had now assumed a deep tropical burn. I couldn't muster up a single 
commonplace out of the thousands in my head. It's an old clock, I told them idiotically. I think we all believed for a moment that it had smashed into pieces on the floor. We haven't met for many years, said Daisy, a voice as matter-of-fact as it could ever be. Five years next November. The automatic quality of Gatsby's answer set us all back at least another minute. I had them both on their feet with the desperate suggestion that they help me make tea in the kitchen when the demoniac Finn brought it in on a tray. Amid the welcome confusion of cups and cakes, a certain physical decency established itself. Gatsby got himself into a shadow, and, while Daisy and I talked, looked conscientiously from one to the other of us with tense, unhappy eyes. However, as calmness wasn't an end in itself, I made an excuse at the first possible moment and got to my feet. Where are you going? demanded Gatsby in immediate alarm. I'll be back. I've got to speak to you about something before you go. He followed me wildly into the kitchen, closed the door, and whispered, Oh, God! in a miserable way. What's the matter? This is a terrible mistake, he said, shaking his head from side to side. A terrible, terrible mistake. You're just embarrassed, that's all. And luckily, I added, Daisy's embarrassed too. She's embarrassed? he repeated incredulously. Just as much as you are. Don't talk so loud. You are acting like a little boy, I broke out impatiently. Not only that, but you're rude. Daisy's sitting in there all alone. He raised his hand to stop my words looked at me with unfortunate reproach, and opening the door cautiously, we went back into the other room. I walked out the back way, just as Gatsby had when he had made his nervous circuit of the house half an hour before, and ran for a huge black knotted tree, whose massed leaves made a fabric against the rain. Once more it was pouring, and my irregular lawn, well shaved by Gatsby's gardener, abounded in small muddy swamps and prehistoric marshes. There was nothing to look at from under the tree except Gatsby's enormous house. So I stared at it, like Kant at his church steeple, for half an hour. A brewer had built it early in the period craze a decade before, and there was a story that he'd agreed to pay five years' taxes on all the neighboring cottages if the owners would have the roofs thatched with straw. Perhaps the refusal took the heart out of his plan to found a family. He went into an immediate decline. His children sold his house with the black wreath still on the door. Americans, while willing, even eager to be serfs, have always been obstinate about being peasantry. After half an hour, the sun shone again, and the grocer's automobile rounded Gatsby's drive with the raw material for his servant's dinner. I felt sure he wouldn't eat a spoonful. A maid began opening the upper windows of the house, appeared momentarily in each, and, leaning from the large central bay, sped meditatively into the garden. It was time I went back. While the rain continued, it had seemed like the murmur of their voices, rising and swelling a little now and then with gusts of emotion. But in the new silence I felt that silence had fallen within the house too. I went in, after making every possible noise in the kitchen, short of pushing over the stove, but I don't believe they heard a sound. They were sitting at either end of the couch, looking at each other as if some question had been asked, or well, was in the air, and every vestige of embarrassment was gone. Daisy's face was smeared with tears, and when I came in, she jumped up and began wiping at it with a handkerchief before a mirror. 
But there was a change in Gatsby that was simply confounding. He literally glowed. Without a word or a gesture of exultation, a new well-being radiated from him and filled the little room. Oh, hello, old sport, he said, as if he hadn't seen me for years. I thought for a moment he was going to shake hands. It's stopped raining. Has it? When he realized what I was talking about, that there were twinkle bells of sunshine in the room, he smiled like a weatherman, like an ecstatic patron of a current light, and repeated the news to Daisy. What do you think of that? It stopped raining. I'm glad, Jay. Her throat, full of aching, grieving beauty, told only of her unexpected joy. I want you and Daisy to come over to my house, he said. I'd like to show her around. You sure you want me to come? Absolutely, old sport. Daisy went upstairs to wash her face. Too late, I thought, with humiliation of my towels, while Gatsby and I waited on the lawn. My house looks well, doesn't it? he demanded. See how the whole front of it catches the light. I agreed that it was splendid. Yes. His eyes went over it. Every arched door and square tower. It took me just three years to earn the money that bought it. I thought you inherited your money. I did, old sport, he said automatically. But I lost most of it in the big panic. The panic of the war. I think he hardly knew what he was saying, for when I asked him what business he was in, he answered, That's my affair, before he realized that it wasn't an appropriate reply. Oh, I've been in several things, he corrected himself. I was in the drug business, and then I was in the oil business. But I'm not in either one now. He looked at me with more attention. Do you mean you've been thinking over what I proposed the other night? Before I could answer, Daisy came out of the house, and two rows of brass buttons on her dress gleamed in the sunlight. That huge place there, she cried, pointing. Do you like it? I love it, but I don't see how you live there all alone. I keep it always full of interesting people. Night and day. People who do interesting things. Celebrated people. Instead of taking the shortcut along the sound, we went down to the road and entered by the big postern. With enchanting murmurs, Daisy admired this aspect or that of the feudal silhouette against the sky. Admired the gardens, the sparkling odor of jonquils and the frothy odor of hawthorn and plum blossoms and the pale gold odor of Kiss Me at the Gate. It was strange to reach the marble steps and find no stir of bright dresses in and out the door, and hear no sound but bird voices in the trees. And inside, as we wandered through Marie Antoinette's music rooms and restoration salons, I felt that there were guests concealed behind every couch and table, under orders to be breathlessly silent until we had passed through. As Gatsby closed the door of the Merton College Library, I could have sworn I heard the owl-eyed man break into ghostly laughter. We went upstairs, through period rooms, swathed in rose and lavender silk, and vivid with new flowers, through dressing rooms, and pool rooms, and bathrooms with sunken baths, intruding into one chamber where a disheveled man in pyjamas was doing liver exercises on the floor. It was Mr. Klipspringer, the boarder. I had seen him wandering hungrily about the beach that morning. Finally, we came to Gatsby's own apartment, a bedroom and a bath, and an Adam study, where we sat down and drank a glass of some chartreuse, he took from the cupboard in the wall. He hadn't once ceased looking at Daisy, and I think he revalued everything in his house according to the measure of response he drew from her well-loved eyes. 
Sometimes, too, he stared around at his possessions in a dazed way, as though in her actual and astounding presence none of it was any longer real. Once he nearly dropped down a flight of stairs. His bedroom was the simplest room of all, except where the dresser was garnished with a toilet set of pure dull gold. Daisy took the brush with delight and smoothed her hair. Whereupon Gatsby sat down and shaded his eyes and began to laugh. It's the funniest thing, old sport, he said hilariously. I can't when I try to. He passed visibly through two states and was entering upon a third. After his embarrassment and his unreasoning joy, he was consumed with wonder at the presence. He had been full of the idea so long dreamed it right through the end, waited with his teeth set, so to speak, at an inconceivable pitch of intensity. Now, in the reaction, he was running down like an overwhelmed clock. Recovering himself in a minute, he opened for us two hogging patent cabinets, which held his massed suits and dressing gowns and ties, and his shirts piled like bricks in stacks a dozen high. I've got a man in England who buys me clothes. He sends over a selection of things at the beginning of each season, spring and fall. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them, one by one, before us, shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many-colored disarray. While we admired, he brought more and the soft, rich heap mounted higher, shirts with stripes and scrolls and plaids in coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange, with monograms of Indian blue. Suddenly, with a strained sound, Daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in the thick folds. It makes me sad, because I've never seen such, such beautiful shirts before. After the house, we were to see the grounds, and the swimming pool, and the hydroplane, and the midsummer flowers. But outside Gatsby's window, it began to rain again. So we stood in a row, looking at the corrugated surface of the sound. If it wasn't for the mist, we could see you home across the bay, said Gatsby. You always have a green light that burns all night at the end of your dock. Daisy put her arm through his abruptly, but he seemed absorbed in what he had just said. Possibly it had occurred to him that the colossal significance of that light had now vanished forever, compared to the great distance that had separated him from Daisy. It had seemed very near to her, almost touching her. It had seemed as close as a star to the moon. Now it was again a green light on a dock. His count of enchanted objects had diminished by one. I began to walk about the room, examining various indefinite objects in the half-darkness. A large photograph of an elderly man in yachting costume attracted me, hung on the wall over his desk. Who's this? That? That's Mr. Dan Cody, old sport. The name sounded faintly familiar. He's dead now. He used to be my best friend years ago. There was a small picture of Gatsby, also in yachting costume, on the bureau. Gatsby, with his head thrown back defiantly, taken apparently when he was about eighteen. I adore it, exclaimed Daisy. The pompadour. You never told me you had a pompadour or a yacht. Look at this, said Gatsby quickly. Here's a lot of clippings about you. They stood side by side, examining it. I was going to ask to see the rubies when the phone rang, and Gatsby took up the receiver. Yes? Well, I can't talk now. I can't talk now, old sport. I said, a small town. 
he must know what a small town is. Well, he's no use to us if Detroit is his idea of a small town. He rang off. Come here, quick, cried Daisy at the window. The rain was still falling, but the darkness had parted in the west, and there was a pink and golden billow of foamy clouds above the sea. Look at that, she whispered, and then after a moment, I'd like to just get one of those pink clouds and put you in it and push you around. I tried to go then, but they wouldn't hear of it. Perhaps my presence made them feel more satisfactorily alone. I know what we'll do, said Gatsby. We'll have Klipspringer play the piano. He went out of the room calling, Ewing! and returned in a few minutes accompanied by an embarrassed, slightly worn young man, with shell-rimmed glasses and scanty blonde hair. He was now decently clothed in a sport shirt, open at the neck, sneakers, and duck trousers of a nebulous hue. Did we interrupt your exercise? inquired Daisy politely. I was asleep, cried Mr. Klipspringer, in a spasm of embarrassment. That is, I'd been asleep, then I got up. Klipspringer plays the piano, said Gatsby, cutting him off. Don't you, Ewing, old sport? I don't play well. I don't hardly play at all. I'm all out of prac. We'll go downstairs, interrupted Gatsby. He flipped a switch. The grey windows disappeared as the house glowed full of light. In the music room, Gatsby turned on a solitary lamp beside the piano. He lit Daisy's cigarette from a trembling match and sat down with her on a couch far across the room where there was no light, save what the gleaming floor bounced in from the hall. When Klipspringer had played The Love Nest, he turned around on the bench and searched unhappily for Gatsby in the gloom. I'm all out of practice, you see. I told you I couldn't play. I'm all out of prac. Don't talk so much, old sport, commanded Gatsby. Play. In the morning, in the evening, ain't we got fun? Outside the wind was loud, and there was a faint flow of thunder along the sound. All the lights were going on in West Egg now. The electric trains, men carrying, were plunging home through the rain from New York. It was the hour of a profound human change, and excitement was generating on the air. One thing sure and nothing surer. The rich get richer, and the poor get children. In the meantime, in between time. As I went over to say goodbye, I saw that the expression of bewilderment had come back into Gatsby's face. As though a faint doubt had occurred to him as to the quality of his present happiness. Almost five years. There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams. Not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man can store up in his ghostly heart. As I watched him, he adjusted himself a little, visibly. His hand took hold of hers. And as she said something low in his ear, he turned toward her with a rush of emotion. I think that voice held him most, with its fluctuating, feverish warmth, because it couldn't be overdreamt. That voice was a deathless song. They had forgotten me, but Daisy glanced up and held out her hand. Gatsby didn't know me now at all. I looked once more at them, and they looked back at me, remotely, possessed by intense life. Then I went out of the room and down the marble steps into the rain, leaving them there together.
Chapter 6 About this time, an ambitious young reporter from New York arrived one morning at Gatsby's door and asked him if he had anything to say. Anything to say about what? inquired Gatsby politely. Why, any statement to give out? It transpired, after a confused five minutes, that the man had heard Gatsby's name around his office in a connection which he either wouldn't reveal or didn't fully understand. This was his day off, and, with laudable initiative, he had hurried out to see. It was a random shot, and yet the reporter's instinct was right. Gatsby's notoriety, spread about by the hundreds who had accepted his hospitality and so become authorities upon his past, had increased all summer until he fell just short of being news. Contemporary legends such as the Underground Pipeline to Canada attached themselves to him, and there was one persistent story that he didn't live in a house at all, but in a boat that looked like a house and was moved secretly up and down the Long Island shore. Just why these inventions were a source of satisfaction to James Gatz of North Dakota isn't easy to say. James Gatz, that was really, or at least legally, his name. He had changed it at the age of seventeen, at the specific moment that witnessed the beginning of his career. When he saw Dan Cody's yacht, dropped anchor over the most insidious flat on Lake Superior. It was James Gatz who had been loafing along the beach that afternoon in a torn green jersey and a pair of canvas pants. But it was already Jay Gatsby who borrowed a rowboat, pulled out to the Ptolemy, and informed Cody that the wind might catch him and break him up in half an hour. I suppose he had the name ready for a long time, even then. His parents were shiftless and unsuccessful farm people. His imagination had never really accepted them as his parents at all. The truth was that Jay Gatsby of West Egg, Long Island, sprang from his platonic conception of himself. He was a son of God. A phrase which, if it means nothing, means just that and he must be about his father's business. The service of a vast, vulgar, and meretricious beauty. So he invented just the sort of Jay Gatsby that a seventeen-year-old boy would be likely to invent. And to this conception he was faithful to the end. For over a year he had been beating his way along the south shore of Lake Superior, as clam digger and a salmon fisher, or in any other capacity that brought him food and bed. His brown, hardening body lived naturally through the half-fierce, half-lazy work of the bracing days. He knew women early, and since they spoiled him he became contemptuous of them. Of young virgins, because they were ignorant. Of the others, because they were hysterical about things which, in his overwhelming self-absorption, he took for granted. But his heart was in a constant, turbulent riot. The most grotesque and fantastic conceits haunted him in his bed at night. A universe of ineffable godliness spun itself out in his brain. While the clock ticked on the washstand, and the moon soaked with wet light his tangled clothes upon the floor. Each night he added to the pattern of his fancies until drowsiness closed down upon some vivid scene with an oblivious embrace. For a while these reveries provided an outlet for his imagination. They were a satisfactory hint of the unreality of reality, a promise that the rock of the world was founded securely on a fairy's wing. An instinct toward his future glory had led him, some months before, to the small Lutheran college of St. Olaf's in southern Minnesota. He stayed there two weeks, dismayed at its ferocious indifference to the drums of his destiny, to destiny itself, and despite the janitor's work, with which he was to pay his way through, 
Then he drifted back to Lake Superior, and he was still searching for something to do, on the day that Dan Cody's yacht dropped anchor in the shallows along shore. Cody was fifty years old then, a product of the Nevada silver fields, of the Yukon, of every rush for metal since seventy-five. The transactions in Montana copper had made him many times a millionaire, found him physically robust, but on the verge of soft-mindedness. And, suspecting this, an infinite number of women tried to separate him from his money. The none too savory ramifications by which Ella Kay, the newspaper woman, played Madame de Maintenon to his weakness and sent him to sea in a yacht, were common property of the turgid journalism in 1902. He had been coasting along all too hospitable shores for five years when he turned up as James Gatz's destiny in Little Girl Bay. The young Gatz resting on his oars and looking up at the railed deck, the yacht representing all the beauty and glamour in the world. I suppose he smiled at Cody. He had probably discovered that people liked him when he smiled. At any rate, Cody asked him a few questions. One of them elicited the brand new name, and found that he was quick and extravagantly ambitious. A few days later, he took him to Duluth, and bought him a blue coat, six pairs of white duck trousers, and a yachting cap. And when the Toulouse left for the West Indies and the Barbary Coast, Gatsby left too. He was employed in a vague personal capacity. While he remained with Cody, he was in turn steward, mate, skipper, secretary, and even jailer. For Dan Cody sober knew what lavish doings Dan Cody drunk might soon be about. And he provided for such contingencies by reposing more and more trust in Gatsby. The arrangement lasted five years, during which the boat went three times around the continent. It might have lasted indefinitely, except for the fact that Ella Kay came on board one night in Boston, and a week later, Dan Cody inhospitably died. I remember the portrait of him up in Gatsby's bedroom, a grey, florid man with a hard, empty face. The pioneer de Bocci, who during one phase of American life brought back to the eastern seaboard the savage violence of the frontier brothel and saloon. It was indirectly due to Cody that Gatsby drank so little. Sometimes in the chorus of gay parties, women used to rub champagne into his hair. For himself, he formed the habit of letting liquor alone. And it was from Cody that he inherited money a legacy of twenty-five thousand dollars. He didn't get it. He never understood the legal device that was used against him, but what remained of the millions went intact to Ella Kay. He was left with a singularly appropriate education. The vague contour of Jay Gatsby had filled out to the substantiality of a man. He told me all this very much later, but I've put it down here with the idea of exploding those first wild rumors about his antecedents, which weren't even faintly true. Moreover, he told it to me at the time of confusion, when I had reached the point of believing everything and nothing about him. So I take advantage of this short halt, while Gatsby, so to speak, caught his breath to clear this set of misconceptions away. It was a halt, too, in my association with his affairs. For several weeks I didn't see him, or hear his voice on the phone. Mostly I was in New York, trotting around with Jordan, and trying to ingratiate myself with her senile aunt. But finally I went over to his house one Sunday afternoon. I hadn't been there two minutes when somebody brought Tom Buchanan in for a drink. I was startled, naturally, but the really surprising thing was that it hadn't happened before. They were a party of three on horseback, 
Tom and a man named Sloan, and a pretty woman in a brown riding habit, who had been there previously. I'm delighted to see you, said Gatsby, standing on his porch. I'm delighted that you dropped in, as though they cared. Sit right down. Have a cigarette or a cigar. He walked around the room quickly, ringing bells. I'll have something to drink for you in just a minute. He was profoundly affected by the fact that Tom was there. But he would be uneasy anyhow, until he had given them something, realizing in a vague way that that was all they came for. Mr. Sloan wanted nothing. A lemonade? No thanks. A little champagne? Nothing at all. Thanks. I'm sorry. Did you have a nice ride? Very good roads around here. I suppose the automobiles? Yeah. Moved by an irresistible impulse, Gatsby turned to Tom, who had accepted the introduction as a stranger. I believe we've met somewhere before, Mr. Buchanan. Oh, yes, said Tom, gruffly polite, but obviously not remembering. So we did. I remember very well. About two weeks ago. That's right. You were with Nick, here. I know your wife, continued Gatsby, almost aggressively. That's all. Tom turned to me. You live near here, Nick. Next door. That's all. Mr. Sloan didn't enter into the conversation, but lounged back haughtily in his chair. The woman said nothing either, until... Unexpectedly, after two highballs, she became cordial. We'll all come over to your next party, Mr. Gatsby, she suggested. What do you say? Certainly, I'd be delighted to have you. Be very nice, said Mr. Sloan, without gratitude. Well, think ought to be starting home. Please, don't hurry, Gatsby urged them. He had control of himself now, and he wanted to see more of Tom. Why don't you... why don't you stay for supper? I wouldn't be surprised if some other people dropped in from New York. You come to supper with me, said the lady enthusiastically. Both of you. This included me. Mr. Sloan got to his feet. Come along, he said, but to her only. I mean it, she insisted. I'd love to have you. Lots of room. Gatsby looked at me questioningly. He wanted to go, and he didn't see that Mr. Sloan had determined he shouldn't. I'm afraid I won't be able to, I said. Well, you come, she urged, concentrating on Gatsby. Mr. Sloan murmured something close to her ear. We won't be late if we start now, she insisted aloud. I haven't got a horse, said Gatsby. I used to ride in the army, but I've never bought a horse. I have to follow you in my car. Excuse me for just a minute. The rest of us walked out on the porch, where Sloan and the lady began an impassionate conversation aside. My God, I believe the man's coming, said Tom. Doesn't he know she doesn't want him? She says she does want him. She has a big dinner party, and he won't know a soul there, he frowned. I wonder where in the devil he met Daisy. By God, I may be old-fashioned in my ideas, but women run around too much these days to suit me. They meet all kinds of crazy fish. Suddenly, Mr. Sloan and the lady walked down the steps and mounted their horses. Come on, said Mr. Sloan to Tom. We are late. We've got to go and then to me. Tell him we couldn't wait, will you? Tom and I shook hands. The rest of us exchanged a cool nod, and they trotted quickly down the drive, disappearing under the August foliage, just as Gatsby, with hat and light overcoat in hand, came out the front door. Tom was evidently perturbed at Daisy's running around alone, for on the following Saturday night, he came with her to Gatsby's party. 
Perhaps his presence gave the evening its peculiar quality of oppressiveness. It stands out in my memory from Gatsby's other parties that summer. They were the same people, or at least the same sort of people, the same profusion of champagne, the same many-colored, many-keyed commotion. But I felt an unpleasantness in the air, a pervading harshness that hadn't been there before. Or perhaps I had merely grown used to it, grown to accept West Egg as a world complete in itself, with its own standards and its own great figures, second to nothing because it had no consciousness of being so. And now I was looking at it again, through Daisy's eyes. It is invariably saddening to look through new eyes at things upon which you have expended your own powers of adjustment. They arrived at twilight, and as we strolled out among the sparkling hundreds, Daisy's voice was playing murmurous tricks in her throat. These things excite me so, she whispered. If you want to kiss me any time during the evening, Nick, just let me know, and I'll be glad to arrange it for you. Just mention my name, or present a green card. I'm giving out green. Look around, suggested Gatsby. I'm looking around. I'm having a marvelous. You must see the faces of many people you've heard about. Tom's arrogant eyes roamed the crowd. We don't go around very much, he said. In fact, I was just thinking I don't know a soul here. Perhaps you know that lady. Gatsby indicated a gorgeous, scarcely human orchid of a woman, who sat in state under a white plum tree. Tom and Daisy stared, with that peculiar and real feeling that accompanies the recognition of a hitherto ghostly celebrity of the movies. She's lovely, said Daisy. The man bending over her is her director. He took them ceremoniously from group to group. Mrs. Buchanan and Mr. Buchanan. After an instant's hesitation, he added, The polo player. Oh, no, objected Tom quickly. Not me. But evidently the sound of it pleased Gatsby, for Tom remained the polo player for the rest of the evening. I've never met so many celebrities, Daisy exclaimed. I like that man. What was his name? With the sort of blue nose? Gatsby identified him, adding that he was a small producer. Well, I liked him anyhow. I'd a little rather not be the polo player, said Tom pleasantly. I'd rather look at all these famous people in oblivion. Daisy and Gatsby danced. I remember being surprised by his graceful, conservative foxtrot. I had never seen him dance before. Then they sauntered over to my house, and sat on the steps for half an hour, while at her request I remained watchfully in the garden. In case there's a fire or a flood, she explained, or an act of God. Tom appeared from his oblivion as we were sitting down to supper together. Do you mind if I eat with some people over here? he said. A fellow's getting off some funny stuff. Go ahead answered Daisy genially. And if you want to take down any addresses, here's my little gold pencil. She looked around after a moment and told me the girl was common but pretty, and I knew that except for the half hour she'd been alone with Gatsby, she wasn't having a good time. We were at a particularly tipsy table. That was my fault. Gatsby had been called to the phone and I'd enjoyed these same people only two weeks before. But what had amused me then turned septic on the air now. How do you feel, Miss Baedecker? The girl addressed was trying, unsuccessfully, to slump against my shoulder. At this inquiry she sat up and opened her eyes. What? A massive and lethargic woman, who had been urging Daisy to play golf with her, at the local club tomorrow, spoke in Miss Bedecker's defense. Oh, she's all right now. When she'd have five or six cocktails, she always starts screaming like that. I tell her she ought to leave it alone. I do leave it alone, 
affirmed the accused hollowly. We heard you yelling, so I said to Doc Kevitt here, there's somebody that needs your help, Doc. She's much obliged, I'm sure, said another friend without gratitude. But you got her dress all wet when you stuck her head in the pool. Anything I hate is to get my head stuck in a pool, mumbled Miss Baedeker. They almost drowned me once over in New Jersey. Then you ought to leave it alone, countered Dr. Kivett. Speak for yourself, cried Miss Baedeker violently. Your handshakes. I wouldn't let you operate on me. It was like that. Almost the last thing I remember was standing with Daisy and watching the moving picture director and his star. They were still under the white plum tree, and their faces were touching, except for a pale, thin ray of moonlight between. It occurred to me that he had been very slowly bending toward her all evening to attain this proximity, and even while I watched, I saw him stoop one ultimate degree and kiss at her cheek. I like her, said Daisy. I think she's lovely. But the rest offended her, and inarguably because it wasn't a gesture but an emotion. She was appalled by West Egg, this unprecedented place that Broadway had begotten upon a Long Island fishing village. Appalled by its raw vigor, that chaffed under the old euphemisms and by the old obtrusive fate, that herded its inhabitants along a shortcut from nothing to nothing. She saw something awful in the very simplicity she failed to understand. I sat on the front step with them while they waited for their car. It was dark here in front. Only the bright door sent ten square feet of light volleying out into the soft black morning. Sometimes a shadow moved against the dressing room blind above, gave way to another shadow, an indefinite procession of shadows, who rouged and powdered in an invisible glass. Who is this Gatsby anyhow? demanded Tom suddenly. Some big bootlegger? Where did you hear that? I inquired. I didn't hear it, I imagined it. A lot of these new rich people are just big bootleggers, you know? Not Gatsby, I said shortly. He was silent for a moment, and the pebbles of the drive crunched under his feet. Well, he certainly must have strained himself to get this menagerie together. A breeze stirred the grey haze of Daisy's fur collar. At least they are more interesting than the people we know she said with an effort. You didn't look so interested. Well, I was. Tom laughed and turned to me. Did you notice Daisy's face when that girl asked her to put her under a cold shower? Daisy began to sing with the music in a husky, rhythmic whisper, bringing out a meaning in each word that it had never had before and would never have again. When the melody rose, her voice broke up sweetly, following it, in a way contra-altro voices have, and each change tipped out a little of her warm human magic upon the air. Lots of people come who haven't been invited, she said suddenly. That girl hadn't been invited. They simply forced their way in, and he's too polite to object. I'd like to know who he is and what he does, insisted Tom and I think I'll make a point of finding out. I can tell you right now, she answered. He owned some drugstore, a lot of drugstores. He built them up himself. The dilatory limousine came rolling up the drive. Good night, Nick, said Daisy. Her glance left me and sought the lighted top of the steps, where, three o'clock in the morning, a neat, sad little waltz of that year, was drifting out the open door. After all, in the very casualness of Gatsby's party, there were romantic possibilities totally absent from her world. What was it up there in the song that seemed to be calling her back inside? What would happen now in the dim, 
incalculable hours. Perhaps some unbelievable guest would arrive, a person infinitely rare, and to be marveled at, some authentically radiant young girl, who, with one fresh glance at Gatsby, one moment of magical encounter, would blot out those five years of unwavering devotion. I stayed late that night. Gatsby asked me to wait until he was free, and I lingered in the garden until the inevitable swimming party had run up, chilled and exalted from the black beach, until the lights were extinguished in the guest rooms overhead. When he came down the steps at last, the tanned skin was drawn unusually tight on his face, and his eyes were bright and tired. She didn't like it, he said immediately. Of course she did. She didn't like it, he insisted. She didn't have a good time. He was silent, and I guessed at his unutterable depression. I feel far away from her, he said. It's hard to make her understand. You mean about the dance? The dance? He dismissed all the dances he had given with a snap of his fingers. Old sport. The dance is unimportant. He wanted nothing less of Daisy than that she should go to Tom and say, I never loved you. After she had obliterated four years with that sentence, they could decide upon the more practical measures to be taken. One of them was that, after she was free, they were to go back to Louisville and be married from her house, just as it were five years ago. And she doesn't understand, he said. She used to be able to understand. We'd sit for hours. He broke off and began to walk up and down a desolate path of fruit rinds and discarded favors and crushed flowers. I wouldn't ask too much of her, I ventured. You can't repeat the past. Can't repeat the past? He cried incredulously. Why, of course you can. He looked around him wildly, as if the past were lurking here in the shadows of his house, just out of reach of his hand. I'm going to fix everything just the way it was before, he said, nodding determinately. She'll see. He talked a lot about the past, and I gathered that he wanted to recover something, some idea of himself, perhaps, that had gone into loving Daisy. His life had been confused and disordered since then, but if he could once return to a certain starting place and go over it all slowly, he could find out what that thing was. One autumn night, five years ago, they had been walking down the street when the leaves were falling, and they came to a place where there were no trees, and the sidewalk was white with moonlight. They stopped here and turned toward each other. Now it was a cool night with that mysterious excitement in it, which comes at the two changes of the year. The quiet lights in the houses were humming out into the darkness, and there was a stir and bustle among the stars. Out of the corner of his eye, Gatsby saw that the blocks of the sidewalks really formed a ladder and mounted to the secret place above the trees. He could climb to it if he climbed alone, and once there he could suck on the pap of life gulp down the incomparable milk of wonder. His heart beat faster as Daisy's white face came upon to his own. He knew that when he kissed this girl and forever wed his unutterable visions to her perishable breath, his mind would never romp again like the mind of God. So he waited, listening for a moment longer, to the tuning fork that had been struck upon a star. Then he kissed her. At his lips' touch she blossomed for him like a flower, and the incarnation was complete. Through all he said, even through his appalling sentimentality, I was reminded of something, an elusive rhythm, a fragment of lost words, that I had heard somewhere a long time ago. 
for a moment. A phrase tried to take shape in my mouth, and my lips parted like a dumb man's, as though there was more struggling upon them than a wisp of startled air. But they made no sound, and what I had almost remembered was uncommunicable forever.